Good morning, Warmth and Winter. Happy Sunday morning. My name is Ingrid McIntyre, and I'm one of the pastors at Glencliff United Methodist Church and also the founder and executive director of the Villages at Glencliff. I am thrilled to be with you this morning. Thank you for having me. And I also want to say that I have been participating in Warmth and Winter since 1988. So you can try to do the math on that one. Hope was an important part of my childhood. I am a PK, a preacher's kid. Anyone else out there? I think I hear a virtual woot woot. And itinerating was part of my job description. Year after year, I would shove my fear down and hold on to hope that this year we wouldn't have to move. And the real hope that I held was that one day I would never have to move again. I would hope that I can have a home that would never, ever change. Looking back, I see that this hope of my childhood wasn't quite what it's all about. Not because it was inadequate or only partly hopeful, but because it focused on me. When I realized I was part of a much bigger family of Christ, I saw that this new kind of hope would require something more of me. It would require expanding my hope to include looking forward to the well-being of others. My family was not just my mom and my dad and my brother anymore. It was the world, and a lot of it looked different from me. This hope meant embracing struggle, leaning on the power of the Holy Spirit, and being attentive to others. In March of 2010, I decided to quit my well-paying job that I knew was definitely not my calling. I knew that when I took it, but sometimes the dollars speak pretty loudly. They often do that. I've known since I was 12 that I was called to work alongside people whose society pushes to the margins and my well-paying job just didn't cut it. So after I quit, my one hope was that God could use me, my quirky, stubborn self, and would send me somewhere I could be of use. Two months later, the 2010 flood of Middle Tennessee devastated Nashville. The Cumberland River, which runs through downtown, crested at 12 feet above the flood stage. And sadly, yet predictably, the vulnerable people in our town were among the hardest hit. So I showed up at a Red Cross shelter that had been set up for about 200 people Most of those people experiencing homelessness who had lived at Tent City and been relocated because 14 feet of water had covered the tops of their encampment homes. There I met three other advocates who would soon become co-conspirators in starting a community with me that focused on housing, healing, and hope. Hope got messy. Hope is messy. That experience kicked off a journey for me that I'm still on to this day. What began with just a little bit of hope, walking alongside our friends who were just trying to find shelter and stability in a moment of crisis, morphed into building an entire new community a community that helps sustains me, hope sustains me. Hope, the real thing, breaks into seemingly strange and unexpected places, often where people think there is nothing. I mean, when we're comfortable, can we even hear God? Are we even listening? 
So often people who are in pain, in some kind of pain, seem to hear and see much more clearly than those of us who are comfortable. Pain often leads to hope because it requires hope. What else can sustain us when life is hard? This has been true for me. I know that if I had been working in my former pretty affluent job, that I would not have been looking for God in the same ways that I do in this thin space where I live now. I didn't know how God could use my gifts, but God takes our perceived weaknesses. Did I mention that I'm stubborn? And uses them as our strengths. Like trying to find affordable housing in Nashville, Tennessee. Y'all, that is hard to do. Maybe God sought me out because I'm the only stubborn ass who wouldn't give up. Who knows? Realize that Holy Spirit hope doesn't require you to be what other people think you should be. Hope, the real thing, will come to life when you let yourself be real. When you let yourself be who God created you to be. John Wesley, the founder of Methodism, saw and experienced similar societal problems that we do now. And instead of accepting them, he raised holy hell about them, mostly just so others could hear his voice and also find hope in his message. The church wasn't living up to the church that Wesley heard and saw described in the scriptures. If there are so many Christians, why are people hungry and thirsty? If there are so many Christians, why is there slavery? Why isn't Christ's presence being felt in the prisons? Wesley became prophetic hope for the church, speaking out boldly and making known that church wasn't and still isn't the building or the denomination. It's Christ's body active and alive in the world, standing outside with those who don't belong until a sense of belonging is experienced by all. Wesley birthed a movement that we continue to birth today. Hope came when a group of people were willing to speak out to be bold, who were unwilling to stay silent, who weren't too afraid to stand up and say, we just can't do this anymore. We can't be living one way at home and another way at church. The flock is not being fed. It is not being sustained. It is not being celebrated and loved there must be more to church than this. And instead of just saying the words, thy kingdom come, Wesley rose up and let God embody the hope of those words through his very flesh. People who didn't live close to the pain of the poverty and the oppression that he spoke about were not very happy with him. Why was he causing such a commotion? I've heard similar comments. Then and now, we have to be willing to show up in the strangest places where nobody else wants to go because that is exactly where God is. Showing up that way is hope in action. That's exactly where hope come al comes alive again and again. Those places inside the church walls and faith traditions, but also outside 
at homeless and refugee encampments, in prisons, in food pantries, in protest, and yes, in political offices. We are still working on prison reform and human trafficking, improvements on people's living conditions, poverty and hunger today. We are actively also participating in systems that marginalize others and have become complicit. Without your hope-filled prophetic voices calling us to a greater consciousness, we will fail as a church. I'm a homeless advocate. I know that I'm not going to end homelessness, but hope is alive in me that through hope and the power of the Holy Spirit, I can do my part. And that is what God is asking. What an amazing legacy we have to build on. What would happen if no one else was willing to call forth the kingdom of God? Kind of like John Wesley, our hope would diminish. Our liberation is caught up in one another's. I'm a different human because of my experiences with people who aren't like me. Hope is rekindled in me through every one of those experiences and relationships. They help me see the fullness of God. As we each take bold steps in hope for transformation, joining our stories with the likes of John Wesley and other faithful people that we've known through history, we know that one day, through God, this hope will be complete. The people I meet on the streets mirror how God shows up. God calls us to be open to those we meet along the way who show us what hope looks like in different places. Each of us. Each of us, you and me and your friends, carry a piece that is meant to be shared. Sometimes those we meet, whether in person or not, remind us of what hope can look like when it's inclusive of everyone. This kind of hope can change unjust systems, can change the world. Mahatma Gandhi gave hope to people on the margins who thought they were powerless, but together they experienced a power greater than any one of them could have manifested alone. And Martin Luther King Jr. brought hope, still brings hope today to those who have systematically been subjugated for hundreds of years, that struggle continuing a white supremacist culture that is often hope-defying, but hope shows up and grows. At first, it came to me through my nuclear family. Then it was the relationships that I made along the way, and now it is a beloved community of all who I've come to know and love and as it moved outward, it grew from an individual hope to a communal hope, one that envisions the well-being of the world, one that overflows and is messy and gets on everything. The foundation of my hope has rested in God and God's people we get it wrong sometimes, but God doesn't and still loves us so much that this hope invites us to experience and participate in that overflow. 
Welcome to the invitation to experience the hope, the bread of life that cannot disappoint us. God has made a place for you at the table. Amen.